I, I don't know what made me do it, but there was a documentary on YouTube about Iowa corn. I said Iowa produces more corn than, than all but five nations in the world. Wow. Not states, nations. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, first, first time I ever went to Iowa, I landed at the Des Moines airport, and I had to rent a car and drive it out of town, and I'm driving out of the airport, and there's corn growing at the airport. And I'm going, these people are serious about it. Same, just like we saw in Kenya. Everybody's using every square inch of ground that they can grow on to grow corn because that's their staple. Um, we got, turn to Genesis 11. Um, the lady that uh, we put in the hospital in Turkana uh, is already doing better. And uh, the swelling has gone down. They drained a lot of that out. And um, I think she has to go back maybe after a few days for another procedure, something like that, to help her along. Uh, but so far, she's doing okay. And the doctor said that probably in a matter of two or three days, she would have been dead. And I'm telling you, God saves people. And he knows when to do it. Now, there's still people starving to death all over the world. I wish that I had the money to make sure everybody had plenty of food. When Jesus comes back, we won't need to worry about that. But for right now, we have, and I'm a capitalist, don't get me wrong. But if the wealthy people of this world would just voluntarily pitch in to feed people, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't, communism would never be able to work anywhere, and socialism, because you would be taking care of the needs of people who cannot take care of themselves. And it's because of greed and wealth, and even capitalism has its limits. And, uh, but I am far from being a socialist or a communist. Genesis chapter 11. Um, God had to step in. This is, and it's not the first time. Think of in Genesis 7, actually Genesis 6, God told Noah, I'm going to have to come down, I'm going to have to stop what's going on. Because, and we'll see this in a minute, mankind reached a point to where the thoughts of his imaginations, God used that word. The imagine, I'll talk about the imagination tonight and how it works. But man's imagination had become constantly evil. And when God sees in a person or a nation, or the whole world, that there is no chance of redemption, God has to step in. In Genesis 6 and 7, he stepped in by flooding the entire world. He had to step in, because that it had got down to where, how many people were on that ark? Eight. Out of... I did a term paper in college on this, and it was about a thousand plus years after the creation, and Henry Morris uh, wrote in one of his books on creation that more than likely there, the population was already in the millions by the time of the flood. But it had gotten, in a, in a thousand years, mankind had gotten so corrupt so easily and so quickly that he had to step in and because he could not redeem man without removing his free will. God will not remove man's free will. Man will lose it by his own choosing, but it'll be his choice. This is why I do not and will not believe that they're going to make people take the mark of the beast by force. That will never happen. Whatever that mark is going to be, 
everybody's going to beg for it. The false prophet is going to bring this world to a place where they're going to want it. He causes them, not forces. The devil does not force anybody. Who is it? You say that. Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. Nope. He didn't. You did it because you wanted to do it. So now, Genesis 11. We're not, we're not, what is Nimrod? Like fourth generation from Noah? And by the time Nimrod comes around, God is having to step in again. He's not going to annihilate the world. He's not going to destroy the population of the earth. He's not going to kill everybody. But he has, to, he has to intervene and put a stop to what's going on. If God has done that in your life, tell him thank you. Tell him thank you because he didn't kill you to have to do it. He left you with your choice and you chose the right thing. So Genesis 11, we'll start at at verse 1, but we're going to concentrate from verse 5 on. Genesis 11, verse 1. The whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, which is Sumeria, which is Iraq. And they dwelt there. They said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had, which is tar, pitch, slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. So last Sunday night, I told you that it is in the nature of man to ascend, to go up. Um, I've been doing a lot of study this last week on some of the Eastern religions, Buddhism, um, Hinduism, and some some words that you've never heard of, so I'm not going to say them because I don't remember them anyway. But they all basically have the same idea in mind, and that is the ascension of man. man. Man can reach a higher awareness or a higher state of consciousness and become one with God. Now, when they say God, they don't believe in a personal entity called God. To them, God is an impersonal awareness, a consciousness. Okay, so they don't believe in one single person called God who was the creator of everything, but they believe in a consciousness level that mankind can ascend to. So in that sense, their religion derives directly from what Satan said to Eve in Genesis chapter 3. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So man has it in him to want to ascend. Why do people climb mountains? Get to the top. Why do I not climb mountains? I don't want to because you can't breathe up there. Um, Lisa and I, last year, when before we took our Alaska cruise, we went to, can't remember what mountain it was, in Washington State. Huh? Yeah, Mount Rainier. And there's this little mountain next to Mount Rainier that you can ride a thing up to. And we rode up there. And I'm walking around up there and I'm going, <gasps> number one, I was out of shape. Number two, there ain't no air up there. But anyway, uh, it's pretty up there. But man has this nature to, uh, to ascend. So he builds buildings. And back in the 1800s, we got as far as we could with brick. You can only build so high with brick. I, I don't know how many stories it is, like 12, 13, 14 stories, something like that. After that, the weight of the building crushes the brick. It's not able to hold up. It wasn't until they started building buildings, the skeleton of buildings out of steel, that man decided, hey, the sky's the limit. So we have the Sears Tower. We have the Freedom Tower now. We had the Twin Towers. They're destroyed. And you've got one in Dubai, I think, that's way up there. But man doesn't stop there. We build the highest tower that we can think of, that we can possibly build, and I'm sure there's plans for higher ones. But man wants to ascend first. We're chasing the Russians to get up to orbit the earth. 
And then the Russians are chasing us to try to get to the moon. They actually sent some guys there and they didn't make it. As we're sending guys up there, they had a failed mission from what I hear. But anyway, we've made it to the moon. Big, and that was a huge thing. That was the biggest thing ever happened in the history of mankind as far as what man is able to do. He put himself 250,000 miles higher than the earth up on the moon. What's next? Mars. And see, it's about ascending up, going up higher. And the higher man goes, the higher man thinks of himself. So that's what's happening here. It's in our nature to ascend. We've chosen God's way of doing it. Okay? The easy way, actually. So now, verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. They have all one language. And this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them. And I have this underlined, which they have imagined to do. So I'll talk a little bit about man's imagination, then we'll get into the language issue. Go to, let us. Notice God is saying us. According to Zechariah Sitchin, according to uh, Eric von Daniken, and all the people on ancient aliens, they believe that God is speaking to the other aliens in the mothership. That's what Von Daniken put out in, in the late 60s. Um, and everybody's followed in his footsteps. God is not a, this creator being. He's talking to the council on the alien ship who planted us here. That's their belief now. They believe that the aliens put us here 1,200 million years ago to see what, how we would turn out. They're not happy about it, so they're about to come down and invade and take over and take us to a higher consciousness, which is Eastern mysticism. UFOism and Eastern Hindu religion are the same religion. But anyway, so let us... He's talking, God is speaking to himself. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God did the same thing when he created man. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So man is created after the image of God. So let us go down there, confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. That they may not, um, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. And I'm not kidding you. I, I was, I, part of this research I'm doing on Eastern mysticism and Eastern religions, I'm watching a video that's teaching about higher consciousness and up pops a picture of the Tower of Babel this afternoon. And it said in the story of the Tower of Babel, the word Babel means gateway to God. No, it doesn't. It means... Okay, what babies do. That's why it's called that. Because the name of it is called Babel because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. See, God explained it. I called it Babel because it sound, I want everybody, when they speak to each other, sound like... Do we not make fun of other people from other countries when they speak their language? Do we not do that? And did you know that everybody does it? It's not just an American thing. They make fun of us for the way we talk. There's nothing wrong with the way we talk, by the way. It's everybody else. Okay? But it sounds like... We have no idea. And that was the purpose of it. Uh, but they, their, their idea was that the word Babel meant gateway to God. Because that tower was how man was going to reach and become God. That's why they said that. And I'm just going, I'm talking to my computer. No, it's not! And it didn't hear me. So, uh, Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Lord, you'd guide us with your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding. Give us meaning. 
Thank you, God, for writing your words in our language for us so that we're not confused. We believe this book. We trust in this book. We ask you, God, to bless us tonight with the words that, have, that are in this book. And give us understanding. Give us wisdom for the times we live in. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. We had a lady here several years ago that was taking night courses. Um, I don't remember. It's one of the colleges somewhere around. And she came in all excited because she took a, a course on etymology, which I like that study of where our language comes from. That's etymology. And she showed me her textbook. Now, this is a liberal arts college, not a religious institution. She showed me her textbook on where speech comes from. And it had a paragraph in there that said most language scholars trace human language back to a mother tongue around 5,000 years ago. That is exactly the Tower of Babel and the time frame. Exactly 5,000 years ago, or roughly. But even those who study language know that at some point at this time, there was a single language. And then something happened, and I don't know how the, how the scholars explained it, but something happened, and all of a sudden now you have all these other languages all over, scattered all over the earth. Well, to me it's very simple. God divided everybody, Genesis chapter 10, by tribe. He then divided them by language in Genesis 11. And then, back in Genesis 10, in the days of Peleg, he divided the earth. He cut the ground, split it in half, and said, there, stay away from each other. Okay? But what is... What is man attempting to do? What, what, will, what will Joe Biden bring back to this country? Globalism. That it's wrong to love your country. It's good to love the whole world and be united with the whole world. Okay? No, it's not. No, it's not. The Bible is very clear. Even when, even when brothers in Christ couldn't get along they separated the Bible's very clear on that Abraham and Lot Paul and Mark did it I mean it, it happens Jacob and Esau even Jacob and Esau when Jacob fell on Esau and apologized for what had happened and he said come with me we got plenty of land Esau said I don't belong with you bro you're my brother and I love you but we don't belong together and Esau had, had wisdom enough to keep going to eat him and stay away from Jacob and his family that way they don't kill each other. And that's, that's how it is. Okay? So, but the world is moving toward globalism. What's the internet doing as far as that's concerned? It's pushing it along. So will we at some point undo what God did at Babel? Will we not, with the internet and the technology no longer be divided by language because the language of electronics, zeros and ones, will be the new language that everybody will speak. Okay? But that's later on. Look back in verse 6. The Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. In this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now, look up on the screen. Who is that? It's in, it's in the Sistine Chapel, St. Paul's. The Sistine Chapel is where the Cardinals meet, not the St. Louis Cardinals. The Cardinals of the Catholic Church meet to decide on who's going to be the next Pope. And they have that area reserved for special gatherings only in the Catholic Church. If the Pope is going to speak to the Cardinals, he meets them under this. This is what Michelangelo did. He painted the ceiling and this, according to Michelangelo, is God. Okay? Now, that's where, I guess, we get our image in our minds of what God looks like. Because we've never seen him. 
Anybody? Dr. Awar says he did. He says he saw God talk to him, and God handed him a bottle of olive oil to anoint the seat for Jesus Christ to sit on, which is a big lie. Okay? Oh, Robert said he talked to him. Other people have claimed that they've saw, seen God, but no, Jesus said no man has seen God at any time. When Moses wanted to see God, God knew that it would kill him. So he said, Moses, you can't see my face. I'll show you my back, but you can't see my face. Now, turn to, um, and by the way, if that's God, why does he have his left arm around a red-headed naked woman? You, deli I, you deliberately can't see how naked she is, but he's got his left arm around this red-headed woman. According to what I know, that's supposed to be Shekinah, God's consort, his woman. Okay? And that's, that's where all the popes are elected, right underneath that. Okay? Uh, who's this? Three different historic paintings of Jesus. But they all look different. Has any of us seen Jesus? When Jesus was around, did, any, did he pose for somebody's picture? No. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. God left us with very clear instructions. He knew what people would come up with. He knew it. Because he knows everything. He knows the nature of man. He knows what man's going to do. And so he told us, don't make an image of me of any kind. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15. God said, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire. In other words, in Exodus 19, the, the movie, The Ten Commandments, when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai and receives the Ten Commandments drawn by the hand of God, Israel was at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses was on Mount Sinai. But nobody, nobody saw God. They heard his voice. They saw the top of the mountain on fire and it covered with a cloud. But no one saw God. And that's what he's saying here. Take good heed unto yourselves. For you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in horror about the midst of the fire. Verse 16, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven, what's that word? Where do images come from? The imagination. We dream it up, what it's going to look like, how things are going to be. Our imagination tries to foretell the future, doesn't it? Okay? I can... Just a silly story that I remember as a child. I remember one night we were going to go to Six Flags the next day. And I could not sleep. I could not make myself go to sleep because I was so excited. And I was imagining in my mind everything I was going to do the next day at Six Flags. I could not, literally could not sleep. I kept saying, I'm going to ride this ride. And I'm going to be, and boy, it's going to be so much fun. And boy, my brain just would not shut down. I was trying to predict the future with my imagination. And that's what people do. They use their imagination to try to foretell how something is going to be or whatever. Okay? And I'll get a little bit deeper than that here in a little bit. But God said, don't corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the air, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, like serpents and lizards, and the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, 
shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God has divided unto all nations under the whole earth, under the whole heaven. And ask yourself the question, out of all of mankind throughout all of history, in every religion, did anybody ever worship the sun? All of them. Did they worship the moon? All of them did. Did they? And they worshiped the sun as a male, and they worshiped the moon as a female. Almost all of them did. And they worshiped the stars. That's why you have Gemini and Taurus and Leo and Virgo and Sagittarius and I don't know what all else. But that's why you have all those up in the air and people say, well, that's my sign there. I'm a, I'm a Leo or I'm a this. It's because astrology is the worship of the stars. You do what the stars tell you to do. And God said, I don't look like any of that. You don't know what I look like. You didn't see me. So don't make an image of me. It's that simple. So that is not God. Can't be God. I don't care what they say. I don't know what God looks like. I just know he don't look like that. Now, the Western mindset of what Christ looks like. A lot of Christian homes have a painting of Jesus. Okay? And I'm not saying that's necessarily right, wrong. I, I don't really like, you don't see any paintings of Jesus here except for there. <laughs> but here's the problem. We're warned about another Jesus and we're warned about an antichrist who says, I'm Christ. Who will say that. And would he not then appear the way that most people have painted his image or sculpted his image of some kind so that people say, well, he looks like Jesus. Okay? So did Jesus tell us to walk by sight or walk by faith? So if you walk and believe what God says in his word then I won't need a photograph of Jesus to hold it up against him when he comes in the air. I'll know him. And I won't need a painting or a photograph or a marble sculpture or anything. I'll know him. Though I've never seen him, I'll know him. John knew him, didn't he? Revelation 1, John knew him. He knew exactly who it was. fell down on his face. He knew exactly who it was. And I believe we'll know him. So we don't need any sculpture, don't need any painting, nothing. And God said, don't do it. So he said, take heed unto yourself. Watch out for the imagination of man. So in verse 5 again of Genesis 6, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now get two sides to your brain. The left side is where you do all your logical thinking. It's where you understand language, you understand math, you, you remember uh, historic events, you remember events that happened in your life. These are all processed with the left side of your brain. The left side of your brain deals with logic and truth and facts and if I uh, ask somebody a question, uh, where were you last week, Wednesday night, 8.30, if they're going to tell me the truth, they will pull the figures and the numbers and the facts, process it out of the left side of their brain, and they'll tell me the truth. If they're going to lie, we have to draw a picture of the lie first. We have to make a movie in our brain of the lie. So we make this movie and then we tell everybody what's in the movie. 
that we made in the imagination of our mind. That's a lie. And sometimes you can even watch people's eyes when people are going to lie. You watch Judge Judy. She knows. When people look down and usually this way to the left, they're lying because their brain is drawing a picture. The right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. Their eyes look down and to the left, and they're making up a story. And Judge Duty always goes, don't look down there. I'm not down here. Look here. Tell me what happened. Tell me what you said. Okay? And she can watch. And police know this. Look at somebody's eyes. If you ask them a question and they're going to look up the answer in their brain, they usually look up to the right. Um, that means that's a sign that I'm looking through all the files and the hard drive on my brain in the database to give you the correct information, okay? That's how our brain works, and, but we need both of them. So if I say to everybody, don't think of an elephant, what did you just think of? An elephant, okay? But there's no elephant in the room. So the right side of your brain drew a picture of an elephant and it presented it to your consciousness, your, your, the way you're thinking right now, you're awake, and it zoomed that image of an elephant to you, okay? So that's how it works. So the left side, the logic part of the brain is the one in charge. If I'm reading my Bible and I'm reading the story of David and Goliath, as I'm reading the Bible, the left side of my brain is processing the words, the language, and telling me the scene, but the right side of my brain needs to be active to draw the picture for me so I can understand it. That's how we process what we read. If you've ever read a book and then they made a movie out of it and you go watch the movie, you're going, well, that ain't how it was. That's because somebody else's imagination drew different pictures than you did. Then it gets real deep. How do we know that what I think is blue is what you think is blue? <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, but at some point in, in less than four generations, from the flood until Nimrod and Babel, man once again had gotten so wicked in his imaginations that God said, I have to stop what they're doing. And that's what he said. Every imagination of the thoughts of it. That's Genesis 6. That was what it was like before the flood. And God had to stop them. Psalm chapter 2. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Vain means it will never work. It will never work. Okay? If you think that you can build your own rocket to go to Mars, it will never work. Why do people imagine vain things? Because the Bible says the creature is made subject to vanity. All of us here are subject in some way to vanity, to things that won't last. And we all like things of this world that will not last. All of us do. Thank God we have a Bible and a God that will always last. We have something everlasting to hold to, but the heathen don't. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. There are evil people in this world who think God can be defeated. But it's a, it's, it, they came up with that out of their vain imagination. And they're going to try it again, the battle of Armageddon, and they're going to lose. Psalm 10, verse 2, The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Notice that. Did they, let me just ask your opinion. Did somebody set up a system whereby they could cheat in the 2020 election? Did they just think of that the day of the election? They've been planning this since 2016. Actually, they were planning it before 2016, and it failed in 2016. And so they planned a different strategy that was part of what COVID was about, and the mail-in ballots, we all know that, and the voting machines and the cheating. 
And from the stories that I've read, Trump on election night was in a skiff, which is a sequestered room with no microphones, cameras, electronics of any kind, catching them in the act. He had to have a private meeting with his key people to, to, so they could talk without being listened to by spies in our own country who hate this country. So they have been imagining how they're going to cheat in this election for years. But I believe the guy in the White House has been planning how he's going to catch them. They seized the servers in Germany. They, they've got them. And if you watch, uh, what's her name? Um, Sidney Powell, one of Trump's attorneys, she'll tell you, we got the goods. We have got the goods. We've got these people nailed. Now they just have to make it get through the court system. But they've got tons of evidence on how these people cheated the 2020 election. Even, even if Trump ends up losing, hopefully, the 2024 election or the 2022 election, hopefully, the good guys in this country will have diminished the bad guy's ability to cheat in the very next election, because I don't trust elections anymore. But that's what it says, let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. Proverbs 6. Look at the, ter, turn your Bible to Proverbs 6. Seven things that God hates. Proverbs 6, verse 16. These six things that the Lord hates. And if God says he hates something, you can bet he's not going to change his mind. Number one, a proud look. God hates a proud, arrogant looking jerk. A lying tongue. Amen? Hands that kill babies inside the womb or shed innocent blood. Then he says, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. That's all of us. Every one of us thought up things, dreamed up things, imagined things. Feet to be swift to running in, in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. And that's what's going on in this country right now, trying to divide everybody. Proverbs 12, 20. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. That's what I just said. When a person's going to lie, what, what side of the brain does it come from? The logic part or the imagination part? Look at your Bible. Deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. If you're going to lie, the right, your imagination is going to draw it out. But liars usually can't keep track of their lies, can they? Because imaginations fade quickly. So a good cop will interrogate someone, and when he thinks they're lying, double back and ask them the same questions again. I was in a deposition one time over a car accident, and I noticed, I wasn't warned about this, but I noticed what the attorney for the other guy did. He asked me questions. I gave him answers. He wrote my answers down word for word, and he'd, he would talk for a while, and then he'd ask me the same question. He said, now, let me ask you this question again, and he'd ask the same question because he, he was trained to interrogate me, and... I was telling the truth. I didn't try to imagine anything, didn't try to lie, I just told the truth. And the lawyer said, you did good in there, but the other guy did too. So anyway, and it was, an, it was a true accident. It just happened. But anyway, but I noticed that's what he did. He tried to question me again to see if I was lying or not, because I wouldn't be able to remember the details of a lie. Okay. Um, Jeremiah, let me read these verses. Jeremiah 7, 24, But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward. Jeremiah 9, 14, But have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after Balaam, 
So guess where false gods are? In your imagination. So have you ever looked at the Hindu gods and their pictures? They're freaky. I mean, out of this world. Look up people who take DMT or ayahuasca or LSD. And the pictures, you know where the tie-dye thing came from? People on acid trips. Because that's what they would see. And they would draw that out. And it was a sign back in the 60s. You, you, you've done acid. You know exactly what that. When you're high on acid, you look at that and it looks completely normal. And you know what it is. But if you're not high, you're going, what is that? Looks like modern art to me. Okay? Uh, you know, that's another thing. Modern art comes from the imagination. Because people throw paint at a wall and everybody goes, oh, oh, man, that is so touching. What is it? It's touching. <laughs> Had no idea what it is. Jeremiah, what was that? Yeah, Jeremiah 1, 11, 8. Yet they obeyed not nor inclined their ear, but walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. Therefore, I will bring upon them all the words of this covenant, which I commanded them to do, but they did them not. Now, look at Jeremiah 13, 10. We're going to see opposites. Jeremiah 13, 10. This evil people, which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart. So, if you don't believe and read the Bible, then your mind will draw a God that doesn't resemble the God of this Bible. So you don't have to actually have a statue of Jesus to be an idolater. You can be an idolater in your heart. You can draw or carve out a God that allows you to sin your sin all you want to. Remember what I preached this morning about the guy with the boxes in his garage? He carved out a God that allowed him to have all that junk up in his garage. His wife knew about it. He had that God carved out in his mind. Why? Because he refused to hear God's words. He refused them. So any church, any religion, any non-religion, humanism, atheist, Atheists draw a God. You know what it looks like? The atheist. Man is God. So in the atheist's mind, he is his own God. He's carved a different God than the one in the Bible. Any religion, any church, doesn't matter what it is. If they abandon the book, then they have to replace it with a God that doesn't resemble the God that's in here. So, in the people in Kenya who worship the false prophet, Dr. O'War, that's why they bowed to him in that picture I showed you. He is their Jesus Christ. Do Mormons worship Joseph Smith? Oh, you bet they do. His words are on equal levels with the Bible. The Book of Mormon, the Pearl of Great Price, Doctrine and Covenants, and then whatever the apostles and prophets say. And it goes, do, do Catholics, do they have the same God that we have? No, because our God is not a carved image. And our God doesn't tell us to pray to Jesus' mother to get our prayers answered. Tells us to pray to God through Jesus Christ. Not Mary, not the saints, not the priests. Directly to God through Jesus Christ. So when you refuse these words, you will automatically draw a different... So that's why when the fake Jesus appears, you have churches all over the world bow to him. Why? Because that's the one that they dreamed up. That's the one that their imagination made up that let them do all the things they're doing. Live in sin. 
but still call themselves, oh, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, but it's not the same one. So he says, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. And what he did was he had a girdle and it's basically a loincloth and he, I think this is the story where he buried it in the earth and it rotted and it had holes all in it and everything like that, okay? And he said, it's good for nothing. And he said, that's what these people are. They're good for nothing. Uh, Nahum 1. This is a verse about the Antichrist. Nahum 1.11. There is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. He's the opposite of Jesus, who is the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. He's the opposite. He is a wicked counselor, and he imagines evil against the Lord. He's the one who's going to sit in the temple of God saying, I am God. But he's not. So, turn to Romans chapter 1. Remember what God said back in Deuteronomy. He said, you did not see me up on Mount Sinai. You did not see my shadow. You didn't see a silhouette of me. You didn't see a, anything that was sim, sim, similar. I'm trying to say the word similitude and similar at the same time. You did not see anything that was similar, a similitude of me. You saw nothing but a cloud. So don't draw a picture, carve me out because you don't know what I look like. So Romans chapter one, here's what happens. This is, this is what happened, I think, before the flood. This was what was being worked on at the Tower of Babel. And this is what's going on right now. Romans chapter one, because that, verse 21, when they knew God and I believe that every human being down in their soul knows God. That's, that's, and I get that from Scripture. You know how your, the, what is it called? Neurons in your brain? The cells in your brain that cause your brain to do what it does, which is think. They're called neurons. Did you know your heart has neurons? Your heart has neurons, which means the Bible's right when it says that people think with their heart. Do we believe Jesus just in our head? No, we believe him. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe where? In our heart. Because our heart actually has the same kind of cells as the brain does. I didn't know that until a few months ago, and I'm going, <gasps> that is so cool. This Bible's right. I love it when the Bible's right. Because that when they knew God, so I think everybody every in their soul has a knowledge of God at some point in their life, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart, see it, was darkened. It means God turned the neurons off in their heart professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into a what? An image from their imagination, made like to corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. That's exactly what God said Back in that verse that we read earlier, Deuter I think Deuteronomy, where God said, you didn't see me, so don't corrupt yourselves and make an image that you say is me. Because that is exactly what Aaron did when they made the calf. Aaron said, these be thy gods, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He said, this is, this is who it is. Vain imaginations. So... What does the Bible tell us? 2 Corinthians 10. Casting down imaginations. 
Can you think of a story in the Bible where somebody was cast down from something? Yeah, Lucifer. Yeah. How they fallen from heaven, old Lucifer. Who else? What happened to Ahab's wife, Jezebel? What ha how did she die? Two or three guys grabbed her and threw her out the top of the tower. Okay, two or three. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Okay, so think of Jezebel as your imagination because she's the woman, right? And we imagine all kinds of evil things. When you're drunk, the alcohol dulls the logic part of your brain and seems to enhance the imagination, doesn't it? Okay, that's why, well, who was it? Mickey Gilly sings, the girls all get prettier at closing time. Because the alcohol dulls the senses and all of a sudden the girl that, when you saw her in the bar, ugly as a dog, now it's 12 o'clock at night and you're drunk and now she looks pretty. Enhances the imagination. God says, cast them down. Like Jezebel. How do you do it? Two or three witnesses. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against what? The knowledge of God. Isn't that what I've been saying? If you, if you remove God's word, you will dream up a God... And many pastors have already done this. They've dreamed up a God that allows everybody to remain in their wicked sins, including the preacher. And nobody stops him. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So when you're having a problem with grief, sorrow, lust, disobedience, rebellion, depression. Depression is our imaginations drawing bad pictures of doom and gloom and bad things that probably are not going to happen. But we're forecasting that they will and it causes deep depression. The best alternative to that is the medicine book. Book of Psalms, Book of Proverbs, little of John thrown in. It's the best way to remove those things out of your mind. Cast them down with the Word of God. Amen? Father, bless your Word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for feeding us, for showing us. Thank you, God, for helping me with my foolish imaginations. God, there's no telling from here on to your return of the things that I'll dream up that are just totally wrong. God, use this book to correct my heart. Bless us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen.